Jordan and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be reviewing and discussing Empire Storms by Sarah J Mass. Now this is the fifth book in the Throne of Glass series. It's a YA fantasy although I think this book if you're on that YA category I definitely feel like this is more leaning towards a new adult read. Also in this book we have two main characters who we have their points of view from that are both of diverse populations. One of the main characters has a disability and another main character has come out as being bisexual. I did mention in my Queen of Shadows book talk that you should read The Assassin's Blade before Queen of Shadows. You definitely need to read The Assassin's Blade before reading this. At least the first three novellas. Assassin and a Pirate Lord, The Healer, and the desert. There are a lot of components and characters from the Assassin's Blade novellas that play significant roles. It's awesome to finally see all those different plot lines and different areas of the continent start to weave together and form this really intricate storyline with all these really intricate relationships. I mean it's probably obvious that this is a five-star book for me. I love how she writes her characters in a way that I have an opinion on every single character. She writes her side characters with such backstory and description and conviction. So this was a fantastic read. I totally devoured it. I can't wait for the final book even though it's gonna be so sad. I hope that it's a really really long book. I would take a thousand page book. I mean I wouldn't complain at all. So those are all of my thoughts for the non-spoil section of this video. We're gonna move on into the spoilery goodness. There's just so much going on and I don't even know where to start so we're just gonna jump in and kind of see where where we lead. So the book opens with this prologue and it takes place from Gavin and Elena's point of view. So hundreds of years before Throne of Glass, we learn that Elena is kind of the central issue to why everything that happened happens. They're fighting the Valg. Her father Brandon had this lock mechanism made to help defeat them. In order for the lock to be created, Mala had to sacrifice herself. Also, while she was with Brandon, they had Elena, and so that's why the bloodline runs so pure with magic, is because they are direct descendants of a goddess. I'll get more into that a little bit later. Brandon also, in order to use the lock, had to sacrifice himself. So it seems like you need one sacrificial victim to create the lock, and another one to use the lock correctly. Elena's like, you know what, this war is going to shit, steals the lock from her father and uses it to imprison Erwin in that tomb. Everybody flips their shit when she does this. She ruined pretty much everyone's plan. Surprise, not only were the Valg stuck in the Throne of Glass world, but these gods and goddesses were also stuck in the world. And the gods and goddesses had said to Brandon, if you are able to open this ward gate, we will take all of the Valg with us. When Elena decides to use it to imprison him in a tomb and not really actually banish him, she also causes the gods and goddesses to lose their ride home. So they're not very happy with her and they kind of end up cursing her bloodlines. The only person that will be able to create a lock is a direct descendant of her. And we have two descendants from her. We have the Haviliard line and the Galathinius line. The way the gods phrase things, it totally sounds like a prophecy. It absolutely plays right into the prophecy that I kind of concocted in my head in that conspiracy video. So that was super, super cool to see play out. So Aelin and crew are on this hunt throughout the majority of the book for this lock. They aren't aware that it needs to be recreated. When they finally find it, it turns out to be this magic mirror type artifact was kind of an instruction guide to create the lock. What was really cool about this mirror is that it was constructed by Elena, Gavin, and Rhiannon, the Queen of the Crotians, which is super ironic because those three bloodlines have direct descendants of our main characters who I think are going to play like the most crucial roles at the end of the sixth book which would be Dorian, Aelin, and Manon. And like I mentioned the Mala and Elena bloodline runs in both the Haviliard and the Galathinius houses so perhaps Dorian could also sacrifice himself to create this lock. And I feel like that's a bigger possibility unless Moss plans to throw a Veronica Roth at the end of this, which I really hope she doesn't. I feel like Dorian has a higher chance of death than Aelin does just because he's not the main character of the series and I could see him sacrificing himself for like this greater good scenario. I mean I could see Aelin doing that too but I think people are going to be like you're too valuable to do this like Dorian might not be as crucial to building that new world as Aelin is. We hear at one part that Dorian's magic is basically a rival of Aelin. Like he is just as powerful just as strong as her. He has the ability to create ice, flame, he has healing abilities and he could even potentially shapeshift. So if he has the ability to create fire, that would mean that Mala's 
magic runs true in him as well. He just hasn't been able to harness that aspect of his magic yet. We've really only seen him use his ice abilities and these weird phantom hand things. Maybe there's a lot more to Dorian's magic than we're getting. I wonder if he's that powerful because his dad was infected with the Valg when he impregnated his mom, which could also possibly be why his brother who I don't remember his name. He's Joffrey. Like I, that is how his brother acts and behaves. So maybe he's Joffrey because of his father being possessed by a Valg. Which also makes me wonder if his brother could play this sacrificial role. Like that'd be really cruel to sacrifice your younger brother for the cause. I don't know. He seems like a jackass. I'm like maybe, maybe this could be his redeeming quality or something. His brother is mentioned really offhandedly a lot, but he hasn't really played a role in the series. Maybe this will be how Mass will be able to work around either Dorian or I don't know. We haven't gotten a finale book from her yet, so we don't really know how she approaches finales. If she wants to decimate our hearts or if she's going to find a way to work out all of the problems. Also what I think is super interesting is on the mirror that they do find in the marshes is there's like this inscription and it says something like fire and iron and silver and gold and it has like these two different descriptors and each fits Manon and Aelin. And also we have a queen of the humans and fae as Aelin is a demi fae and then we have the queen of the witches. So between the two of them they represent the three main species on this continent. And also if you think of it as more like Aelin represents fae, non-witches, and Dorian humans, the three of them also represent all three races on the continent. I don't know what she's gonna do with that but I feel like Manon is gonna play a really big role in the next book and I'm super excited about it. I've come to really, really like her, which is ironic because when I read Air of Fire, I hated her. I hated all the witch chapters. I didn't understand what they had to do with the overarching story at all. So let's really quickly just talk about the ships, the ships, the ships, my fleet of Sarah J. Mass ships. So first, we obviously have Rowan and Aelin, which are my ultimate ship. I love them so much, and I love where the relationship went in this book. Finally, they slept together, which I've been waiting for since Air of Fire, Queen of Shadows, who had the most sexual tension. And what was she doing to me? She was killing my soul with that book. A lot of people have a lot of problems with that sex scene. It didn't bother me at all. I have no qualms about being on the beach. I don't really care. I don't care if people can see them from the town. I don't care if there's a hurricane in the harbor. I don't really care. I'm just happy it happened. Plus, I just love Rowan so much. Forget Aelin. He's meant to be with me. I love that we learned the truth of his mate in this book. That was horrific that Maeve would do that and that she has the power to do that, that she could warp his like feelings and his his ideas and, and how he's perceiving situations to think that Lydia was his mate. Maeve orchestrated this whole thing to really break him down where he was at a point that he couldn't even recognize his feelings for an, his actual mate. Made me like really upset because poor Lydia had no idea this happened to her and she died not knowing that she was played the whole time. I mean, that just sucks. And then at the end, when Rowan comes running up the beach, is like, where's my wife? Where is my wife? My heart crumbled into a million pieces. And I think what she did was a very smart move. She made it so if something were to happen to her, she would get captured. She had a stake and a claim in Terrison and she had somebody that could act in her place. A brilliant strategic move. Also just like, I love them so much. And then next we have Dorian and Manon, who I totally ship. Like, like I said, Manon is growing on me so much and I am liking Dorian more and more. I like this darker Dorian. A lot of people are really bothered by him because he's not this happy-go-lucky like Prince that's just hitting on all these ladies and it's just like a spooner but he's been through some shit in these books like his his girlfriend got beheaded right in front of him he had a valve put in his body that made him do all these murderous acts and like traitor to his kingdom he was forced to murder his dad I mean he's seen some shit so I don't ex I don't expect him to be this like skipping through the park Dorian like he was in book one I love dark damaged characters, I guess is the best way to say it. Like when they've got a tragic backstory. I know that's like a cliche, but it's a cliche that I love. The scenes on the boat between the two of them where he like goes and visits her room at night and like has all these snarky comments with Aelin about, well, why can you have an immortal lover and I can't? And banter between the two of them was off the charts fantastic in this book. The scene between Manon and Dorian was, mm -hmm. I loved it. Then we have Lysandra and Adian, who I have to say I wanted more from in this book. The scene where he tells her that he wants to marry her just nearly like killed my insides. 
I was not expecting that. It came out of nowhere. Yes, they're finally gonna be together. And then they spend the whole book being like friends and just like casually ignoring their feelings for each other. And I'm like, what the heck, you two? By the end of the book, they hate each other because she pretends to be Aelin. Aelin's pissed at Lysandra about that. So they're not even add into the book on a good note. Hopefully we can resolve that hatred thing because that's a problem. But I really like them together. I think it's so cool, like the Wolf of the North and then she's a shadow cat or a ghost leopard. A shadow cat, ghost leopard. How they're both like have these animalistic personas. I think that they are a badass, incredibly strong, just powerful duo, and I want to see them actually be together. Give it to me, Sarah J. Mass. And the last ship we have is a lead in Lorcan, who I felt really guilty shipping because Lorcan's such an asshat, and a lead is like very naive in certain aspects. Well, like a lot of aspects. She's very trusting for someone who's been in prison for most of her life and has been around such bad people. But the more they interact with each other, I loved them together. I love how she puts him in his place. Like he has this legendary persona of being this terrible asshole who just is the scary god of like death pretty much. I don't care. You don't treat me like that. You don't talk to me like that. I am your equal. You will respect me. And I love that. I love that she was strong and feisty in a different way from a lot of other characters because she has no magical abilities. Although I feel like she might have something. I'm interested to see what she contributes to the group. She is a descendant of the Iron Teeth bloodline. So I feel like she has to have something and she's also really good at spinning lies. And for someone who doesn't have a lot of interaction with people for the majority of her life, I don't expect her to have such wonderful social skills, so I'm interested to see if she has a bit more to her than what we think she does. I do have to say that parts of their storyline kind of dragged a little bit for me. I felt like a lot of the scenes of them traveling with the carnival kind of lulled at some points, and I was also really confused why they're both on these time-sensitive missions, but yet they were like, let's just hang out with this carnival for a couple weeks, because why not? Also, she had a period scene in this book, which was mortifying and funny and endearing all at the same time because Lorcan tore up one of his t-shirts for her as like bandages and that was so sweet. It was the first really big moment that we see Lorcan being kind to somebody. I feel like he had such personal growth with her. Like she really opened his eyes to what life could be like without Maeve's influence. And now that he is broken from Maeve, I'm hoping that he can be a really valuable asset to Aelin's crew because Aelin's crew is gonna be badass. We just need to free Fenris and his brother. And that's gonna be a kick-ass crew and I wanna be a part of it so bad. So we also have this scene where Aelin's on the boat in Skull's Bay and she's tunneling down into her magic. She's wearing one of the war keys and she taps into the war key accidentally. It seems like one of the goddesses has the ability to communicate through the war key like it opens like a portal and Deanna is able to take control of her. Deanna is described as having moonlight features like silver eyes. It makes me wonder about Amran from Akramath. She's a character that we don't know a lot about. All we know is that she's more powerful than the High Fae. She's older than all the High Fae and she's from some other land. She traveled to the Akramath world in a wrinkle of time. So it seemed like she could have possibly gone through a ward gate. So Trina had this wonderful idea like what if Amran is a goddess? What if she's Deanna? That would suck for Deanna because that means Deanna got trapped in two worlds she doesn't belong in. It would make her more powerful than the Fae and older than the Fae. We all are expecting the two series to overlap in some way, so maybe this is going to be the connection. It's going to be this character who accidentally gets stuck in two different worlds. Then also at the beginning of this book, Manon kills yet another witch. Her grandma is just livid. Like, how dare she keep killing the witches? Who does she think she is? So she sentences Astrin to death as punishment. Manon shocks us all and goes for her grandma instead, and I was like, yes, that bitch had it coming. God, I hate the matron. She's a terrible person. She's not your cuddly cute little grandma that you want to hang out with. And I did think it was super ironic that both Asterin and Manon now have been kind of cast out by the matron and as a result they both have these terrible scars across their stomach. In the same scene we find out that Manon is actually part Crotian and part Iron Teeth. Her dad was a Crotian prince. It leads me to believe that witches have to have like, a male and a female to create a witch. So where are all the male Iron Teeth witches? Like where do they just not exist? Like how do the Iron Teeth not produce in the same way? 
I, I don't get how that works because we literally have never seen a male witch except for the Croatian prince, which means that they exist. And Manon is completely having an identity crisis because she's like, whoa, I'm an iron teeth and a Croatian. I'm the last of the Croatians. I'm literally the Croatian queen. I'm supposed to run their peoples. We can't even find their peoples. I killed my half sister. Like she's realizing her whole life is a lie that she was born to be the symbol of peace between these two warring species of witches, but she was ended up being bred by her grandma to be this like machine of war. I think it's also important real quick to mention where Maeve sits in all of this because Maeve is a continual problem in this book. Like she's like a backseat problem. She's not their immediate threat, but she's starting to be a bigger nuisance as the book goes on. And it's important to realize that she doesn't side with Aelin. Like you'd think they'd want to get rid of all the Valg, but she doesn't want to sacrifice the power of the ward keys to do it. And she wants to utilize that power to make herself queen of everything. She'd rather just live in blissful ignorance that the Valg even exist and that they're not really a problem. We visit Skull's Bay in this book. Love the whole pirate vibe, but because Rolf has a previous history with Selena and not Aelin, we get to see Selena reemerge for a bit. And Selena's just a funner character because she's not as burdened as Aelin. She's just so sassy and snarky. And it was so much fun to see her again because I really missed that like air of snarky superiority. Holy shit! That battle though in Skull's Bay, that was the most intense moment of the book for me. Sandra turns into the sea dragon that she's been mimicking from these carvings in the Ilium temple. She is badass. She is so much more impressive and I gave her credit for. Her. I'm so glad that she's made a 180 and that she is the character that she is because she's so cool. So these enormous wyverns come after her and she somehow manages to kill them still despite being tired and defeated and wounded. She kicks their butts with reading these scenes from Adian's point of view and hearing how concerned he was for her was so endearing and not a side of Adian we see very often. Let's talk about really quickly where she gets this idea to even be a sea dragon. So they talk about this other race of people. I don't remember what they called the Mycenaeans. Tie into Rolf's history, like he could be a descendant of one of these peoples or creatures. And they're like these seafaring people and they have the ability to transform into sea dragons or they have sea dragons. They have this tavern maid who has these tattoos on her hands that are of like writhing sea dragons and her eyes are the color of like the sea. And they have all these carvings and paintings in that temple in Ilium, which is a city within Terrasen, which would mean that these people are technically loyal to Aelin. Are they like shapeshifters or can they just turn into sea dragons? I really wanna know more about them. We have another epic sea battle at the end of the book. It was really cool to see something different and to see them all in action on the water. I loved it. I thought it was so like Pirates of the Caribbean-esque. Only really was Rowan able to convince several of his relatives in Maeve's army to turn against her. I mean, why would she take so many of Rowan's peoples with her over there when she knows Rowan's on the other side. He appealed to like their human side, the love of them and their mates and their families. And I thought that was such a unique approach to getting them to be on his side. Then we have Astrid and the 13 and all the wyverns showing up. And then we have Ansel finally coming in. I've been waiting so long for her to make an appearance. See her back in action and to see her and Aelin's banter back in action. Gosh, Aelin called in so many debts that we didn't even know she had available to her. And we had no clue what she was doing. Even her people were like criticizing her for not having allies. And it was so freaking cool and like empowering. And Aelin wasn't even there. We have Elias and the Silent Assassin show up. I'm so excited to have more kick-ass assassin fighting because I missed that. And then we have the the prince from Wendelin, the Ash River Prince show up. I'm so excited we're getting more of like the Wendelin people involved. Oh, I'm so excited about it. I also think that Gavriel has a pretty high rate of mortality as well. Like I could see him being a character that gets killed off. I see him doing it in sacrifice of his son because we find out how rare it is for Faye to actually have children. I would love to be wrong in this one because I like that we have a parental figure amid all these characters who lost their parents. Maybe he won't die then. As much as it pains me to say this, goddamn, I feel like something's gonna happen to Rowan. I have felt like this since mid Queen of Shadows too, and I'm hoping I'm wrong. You can tell that in both of her series that she holds this idea of like true love to really high regard. So maybe she'll save that ship and not completely ruin it. That would be nice. 
But I'm also hoping that we are able to save Fenris from Maeve. She didn't release him at the end of this book like she released the other two traitors. So we need to save Fenris and his brother and they have like this really cool ability to wither, is it wither? Willow? What is the term from Akamath? Wither, willowing? Win winnowing. Their power seems very similar to winnowing in Akamath. So I wonder if there's any correlation between that as well, like with the Amran in her eyes and Deanna type incidents. But I also think that Fenris is so upset with Maeve and he's not loyal to her out of any other reason than his brother safety. So I feel like he can serve as a really great spy for Aelin and, and he can help them find her. So at the end of this book, we have Lorcan, Elide, Gavriel, and Rowan on the hunt to find Aelin. We have Adian and Lysandra heading north as Queen of Terrison and her general to gather all of Aelin's allies, cement like a force in Terrison. And then we have Manon, Dora, and the Thirteen going to the wastelands to find the Croatian witches. Which leads me to a very interesting thing because they're heading to Terrison. Aelin doesn't even have a claim on Terrison. Like her noble families dismissed her claim completely. They've had elections and they have like this democratic style thing set up there and they don't want their monarch. They don't want Aelin to be there. They feel like she's abandoned them. So I don't know how she's going to solve that problem, but she said she was going to take back her land regardless of what Darrow says. So that seems like a pretty big problem when you're trying to stake a claim and save a country it doesn't even want you to be there. So also, I feel like we have to talk about kale. Maybe a hundred or so pages into the book, I realized we haven't had any kale. And then I was thinking, I don't really care that he's not in this book. And that's clear from somebody who was a previous huge fan of Kale. I feel like he wouldn't have really had anything to offer in this storyline. All these other people were in play, all these other pawns were being moved, and I feel like he would have just convoluted the story a little bit more and made this book super long. So I'm fine with her taking him out. She says that she has some big massive plans for him, that he's going to do some great things. I'm really excited to see the Southern Continent. I'm really interested to see the Healer's Compound and to finally, hopefully, meet Irene. And I feel like his novella is going to end up being like a normal size book. And I hope it comes out in a hardcover book because I really want that. Really quickly, I want to talk about this idea that I had. I swear I read a sentence in the book somewhere that listed the gods and goddesses. On a curve type things to describe them. Stating their names like Deanna, it was God of Moonlight. And the way it was listed felt like one of our main characters could fit each description of the god or goddess. Some of the characters also already have this connection to one of the gods or goddesses. Aelin and Mala, Lead and Annie, or Lorcan and having this like connection to this dark death god. So I wonder if one of our characters is like a descendant or personification of the gods and it's gonna be like those eight characters that play the most significant role in freeing the gods. We know the gods are in our universe, we know they need to be sent back with the Valg and they're like crucial to this whole situation, but we don't see them really in play right now. We seem to just be like sitting back and waiting, like watching the chips land where they may. So I wonder if they're pulling the strings of certain characters, like they each have their stake in one of the characters. It just seems like the qualities of the main characters align with qualities of the gods. Dorian even makes a comment saying that they're scions of the gods. So I think that's all I really have to say about this book. I know that's all I have to say after I've been sitting here for like an hour talking about it. Thank you guys so much for watching and until next time I'll talk to you very soon. Bye!